You ever think about quitting? It's the combat of life, hammering the snot out of you. Well, stand by, dig in deep, and get ready to get fired up with us. Welcome to the Team Never Quit Podcast, the number one podcast that inspires you to fight on. I'm your host, David Rutt Rutherford, here with Mr. Never Quit himself, Marcus Luttrell. Our mission is to help you embrace the suck of life, to teach you the values of working your ass off, and to interview the most hard-charging people on planet Earth. We know life is hard. It's time for you to suck it up, buttercup, and let us teach you to persevere in every environment imaginable by sharing real-world lessons learned by those who never quit. That's right. It's time, Marcus, for us to help them defeat the well, negative you're insurgency me up, man. in their you're lives. Fire me up. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's roll. Let's roll. Let's roll. Thanks for doing this, brother. Coming on here and, uh, and yeah, our next guest, buddy of yours. I've actually met him. Yeah, yeah, you met him. You and Morgan both have met him. Yeah. When did uh, when did you guys meet? So we met several years ago. It's a great story. David had just kind of wrapped up his NFL career and was had moved to Dallas. Got to know a few friends that I knew, and you know, looking at buying a building and starting a gym. You know, I think the transition as an NFL player is very similar the transition as, a, as, a, as an elite operator, oh, right? Just sure, like man. Radical reinvention of who and what you are. And so... Well, plus the connection that you were... A, I mean, you have a significant history in football yourself. Sure, sure. Um, and so he came down to the office to visit with me, and, and uh, you know, after, after three hours, I called his buddy, the real estate broker, back, and I said, hey, man, thanks so much for introducing me to Dave. Got some ideas for him. He's talking about building from you. Let's go grab a beer uh, next week. And he's like, what? And I said, yeah. Um, <laughs> Bye. We're going to go. Let's go get a beer next week. He's like, no, before that, I'm like, David Boer is a great guy. He's like, after that, I'm like, he's not going to buy a building from you. <laughs> he's like, man, I'm like, this is not the right thing for him to do right now, man. And and this guy's a classy, wonderful guy. He goes, I knew. I knew that was going to happen. You know, the, the Has he introduced you to so, anyone after that? Oh, no, no, no. I, I, he hasn't even actually returned my phone calls. <laughs> well. He doesn't speak to me anymore. I don't know yeah. friends anymore. Exactly. Hey, it's Clint again. Just calling you, checking in, see if you're there. Hit me, yeah. hit me back. <laughs> don't, know, don't know if you still have my number, but this is it. This is still I was in number. there drying my hair. I thought I heard the phone ring. You remember Cable Guy? <laughs> remember Cable Guy with Jim Carrey back in the day? <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. Chip again, just calling. He stuff. showed up at his work randomly. Apparently, he doesn't work there anymore, but <laughs> that's what they keep telling me about. <laughs> I was following him one day, and that's exactly where it went. He does still work there. The, uh, now, but uh, let me tell the story a little more. Let me kind of take – so, you know, born in, born in Oregon, uh, you know, is, is, comes from a long line of Marines. His, his grandfather was amazing. His dad played uh, linebacker at the University of Oregon. Just this incredible family who I've gotten to know had really one Division One offer. Is a really – I mean, that's just where the talent was in Oregon at the time. Went to the Idaho Vandals, played for them from day one, showed up. Four-year starter uh, was kind of deemed to have NFL-level talent. His senior year was the last man drafted. He was Mr. Irrelevant in the draft, uh, which that happens every year, right? But what doesn't happen usually the next mm. year is Mr. Irrelevant sometimes doesn't make the team, maybe takes two or three years of a day. David started. David started during that rookie season, uh, developed a great mm. reputation in the NFL, had some amazing teammates, his friends. You know, one of his good friends is James Laurinaitis, whose dad is – you know, part of the Road Warriors, man. Ooh, what a rush. You know, those guys. <laughs> Went to the Seattle Seahawks. Um, was doing well there. And then, you know, football's a violent game. And he came out on the wrong side of a collision, shredded up a shoulder. And then, you know, I, I don't want to tell too much of his story because the story is amazing. But what that led to was a, a, a self-medication and a self-treatment that um, – was not going the right direction and him being a self-aware guy I decided to and a well-loved man his, his bride's amazing uh check himself in his story but you'll hear the story about what that was like and then kind of rediscovering who he is and what he is now like his relevance and his usefulness to his fellow man it's a it's a neat story that i'm excited for the listeners to hear yeah i mean it's man it's the hardest thing to deal with when someone looks at you and goes you're not you're not cut out for this anymore you know what I'm talking about? Especially if it's somebody outside of your uh, community, like the doctors. And I mean, they're great, doc. Don't get me wrong. And they are right. But when you're like, hey, man, you're more of a liability than you are an asset physically. You can't keep up anymore. And you're not. I mean, that's like, what? 
Yeah. We, we're talking about, yeah, I need mean, to work out harder. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Somebody who's never hmm. done what you've done telling you can't do what you do. Yeah. It's tough medicine. Yeah, dang. Well, you know what? What was what was interesting that Clint and I we were talking about this as we were discussing how the shoulder in- injury uh, forced you know Vibora to uh, leave, and then all the subsequent issues that came on after that. And you'd said something like, "When you're forced to leave the league, or at least in sports, when you're forced to leave, it's yeah. it's kind of like uh, go ahead and go ahead and hand that to us real quick. I yeah, like I mean, that. And so we talk about transition, right? Everybody's got a transition. Everybody listening right now has gone through this moment where you thought you were going to be and do and continue and you didn't. So you have to reinvent yourself, right? So veterans, mm-hmm. we go through that. Everybody does. Special operations community, elite athletes go through that too. And the difference though, between some of the NFL players and, and elite athletes and, and some of us is a lot of times we elect when we're done, like it's, you know, we could transition right. out at, at a yeah, time of our right. choosing or yeah. in the league as an elite athlete. It's, it's like getting broken up with. I mean, the, the, the thing that you love divorces you, the thing that you love breaks up with you. The thing that you love tells you you can't anymore. And so you don't have mm-hmm. much authorship over the time. And rarely, sometimes you do. Sometimes you get to go out like Tony Gonzalez and Peyton Manning and, and Tony Romo. And so and probably not Romo. Because He'd keep playing if he could. He just can't anymore. So mm. it's a brutal transition for a lot of athletes because you, it's not your choice, but you got to deal with it. Well, the craziest part about it is it's almost exactly the same for us when we rotate out, especially if we're hurt, right? You talk, he talks about having getting on the Vicodin and stuff like that. I mean, that, yeah, that's, I, that's what I think I, he's getting at there. All yeah. of us run that. I mean, if we got stuck on that line, we know what that is. And, you know, climbing mm-hmm. out of that and then switching direction and, I mean, this guy kind of embodies that. So we started training, you know, elite athletes like a lot of these guys do. And then over at TRG, we have just, you know, so many guys come in. You know, Marcus, you're in there, Morgan. Traumatic wounded veterans come in. And I could watch him as he built his gym, watching some of these traumatic wounded veterans come in. And, and, and he'd start talking to them and sort of fell in love with uh, helping these guys learn how to compete again. I mean, just finding a way to compete again. We got a triple amputee Marine named Kenny Callish. And, I keep entering him in these arm wrestling contests. And he's like, why do you do that? I'm like, well, you only got one arm, man. What else are you going to compete in? But it's like you got to get guys <laughs> competing again. And, and they and they Jesus. rise to it, especially the devil dogs, man. The devil dogs are amazing. Hmm. And, they, and really what he found is he loves mentally coaching elite athletes. He loves physically coaching uh, carnivores. You know, when we have guys walking into the office, I look at them. I go, hey, man, you got two choices. You're not a wounded warrior. You were wounded but you're not wounded anymore, that, that happened. That's real, but that's not what you are. I said, here, you need to be a recalibrated carnivore or a re-engineered elite. And I always know which one I'm talking to because the Marines, you don't even get to finish it. They go carnivore. I'm like, I, I didn't even told you the second one. I'm like, well, we don't care what I'm going to be a carnivore. I'm like, well, listen, I'm an officer. I wrote a PowerPoint brief up about this. We're going to justify my words. You're going to at least do this. Slow down. You just took my thunder. <laughs> yeah. it's like, it's like, and it, and it's, that's what he's doing now, man. He's taking these recalibrated carnivores and reintroducing them into the competitive world. Like right now, I mean, he's coming off the slopes right now because he's got 22 veterans going down the ski slopes in California right now, you know, learning how to ski again, snowboard again, mono ski again, you know, you give it, you give a, you give a banged up devil dog, you know, skis and an objective, those those cats are fearless, man. Put the skis going. Take gonna, that hill. The missile on rails. Yeah. Take that hill, Marine. Roger that. Let's go. Remember that, remember that movie, Better Off Dead, Marcus? Uh-huh. You might be too, too young for this. Remember that movie, Better Off Dead, where a guy comes up and goes, listen, go down the hill as fast as you can. And if anything gets in your way, turn. Like, that's the coaching <laughs> advice. Like, that's what's happening. That's what's happening in California right now. That's awesome. Well, I think we're going to talk to him uh, while they're out there. So while he's out yeah, there. So. Yeah, he's coming off the slope for how to make this call. Oh, I'm cool. anxious to hear from him. What do you yeah, say? Yeah, absolutely. Let's get him on. Get him on. Do we get it off? All right. So, Mad Minute, rapid fire questions. No time to think about it. What your soul's answer is, is what we're going to get right now. So, Sasquatch, yes or no? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> it's always yes. All right, favorite superhero? Superman. Favorite 80s wrestler? Axel. Oh, strong. First car? Uh, moped. 
150 cc little scoot scoot. It was a scoot scoot. Favorite car. Nice. Favorite car. 84 Chrysler LeBaron Town and Country wood paneled convertible. Those are epic. <laughs> Would you rather be thrown into a closet with three water moccasins or a chimpanzee with a grenade and a serious sense of curiosity? God. <laughs> uh, chimpanzee, man. That's what most of my friends are like. <laughs> with a grenade? All right. <laughs> Clint, fire away, bud. Oh. Uh, Clint blacked out. Yeah, Still thinking about the champion, champ, chimpanzee yeah, no, and the grenade. <laughs> So, so it's worth elaborating on the Woody. It can only take two people at the same time because we do not know the strength and integrity of the floorboard. The third person may literally fall through while driving. It is a fact that there's two uh, green fence posts zip-tied along the outside of the frame to keep the, the Woody together in this current state. <laughs> nice. you guys want to, yeah, here's a quick, uh, quick back on the Woody. Uh, body work. I, I was playing for the Rams. The Rams did a special on the billboard at halftime for guys with you know their rides, like Aston Martins and Ferraris. And so... They were doing this, and I said, man, I want to go buy a car on Craigslist. So I bought a, a wood panel convertible on Craigslist for $1,500. Uh, they put it to a sweet track, some Sister Christian, had a fedora hat. It was, uh, it was pretty quality, low-budget quality, but you were, quality video. You were looking for the Griswold family truckster, though, right? I dig it. When you got on eBay, you, when you were looking for the – that's kind of the I, way you were going? No question. I put a fuzzy dice and a Jesus bobblehead, and I think it was good. Absolutely, man. All right, you have 30 seconds to choose between riding in the Red Bull stunt plane or driving Grave Digger in a monster truck rally. Grave Digger. Grave Digger power, man. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to tear some stuff up too, man. All right, movie character you like to play out in real life. Movie character real life. Yep. Marcus Trail, man. Let's do it. Let's go there. <laughs> That'd be a pretty good real life, huh? Oh, Jesus. See how I measure up? Because you always see movies, nice. right? And you say, like, could I ever, right? And I don't care if it's if this example, but, you know, you always ask yourself, could mm -hmm. I? But, man, I mean, put it, live it out in real life. See if you did. Hey, let me tell you something. Um, the life I've been able to have after all of my madness is, and I don't ever talk about this, man, but it is, I, I get to live the American dream every day and see America because of how much I travel. And it is is so unbelievable and amazing that I can't even put it into words, man. I mm. since you brought that up, it is I, man. I'm so fortunate to to be able to do that, and it's unbelievable. So thank y'all for that, man. I know. No, I think it was also really great, Al. You uh, <laughs> made sure Wahlberg knew that you were the alpha male because uh, when Mel lets you know that she used to have a little bit of. Great. You got to tell That's a funny <laughs> shit. Yeah. Great I didn't like that too much. I, 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 they, I'm real protective. My, I'm my wife. I'm just like every guy has man. So I'll tell you that story. Later. Yeah. It's a great one. Though. It's a great one. It's worth telling. So we were driving up to the movie set for the first day. We, we had these guys a couple of months before filming and, and Wahlberg had shown up. So Melly and I were driving out to the range matter of fact, we had uh, good vibrations came on the radio or mm. yeah, good vibrations came on the radio and Mel was, dancing and singing she goes well i had the biggest crush on this guy one and just went on this whole diatribe about how much she loves mark Wahlberg. Ah. which every girl our generation <laughs> loves mark Wahlberg. Oh. i get it okay but uh i pulled up man i got out with an attitude i walked up and he's like hey mark Wahlberg." i was like hey marcus Tuttrell. yeah i thought you'd be taller that kind of thing you know <laughs> just kind of what's up but he's it took about two minutes man he's the nicest guy and that all went away now i know why like yeah you know i I love you too, brother. You're good. You're good to go. That's awesome. Yeah. I don't know how we topped that on the Madden Minute. You want to? You want to roll right into the interview parts now, Wizard? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, let's go for it, David. Again, man, thank you for coming on here. We can't wait to hear your story. What we What we like to do is we bring amazing people on to share their story to our to our audience, man, and kind of give some insight and, and some advice as to how they they got through that and how they live their daily lives and the motivation that they have. So, if you could, man, could you share your greatest never quit story with us? Yeah, I think the greatest never quit is, is kind of what you're ashamed of in the moment, right? Or you feel like you somehow failed and you failed with significance and you want to hide it, at least in my experience. And so you know, being a skinny pencil neck football player from Oregon, one division, one offer, always kind of the guy that was on the fence, right? It was good. It was a good player. But the question was, could he play at the next level? So high school to college, college to pro, I was sort of an afterthought, but one that would foster success through the hard work and, and just, and just really effort, you know, overcome those that are more talented with effort. 
So I got to college, became a starter my freshman year, a little skinny 190 pound kid playing linebacker with my butt lit up. And then uh, when it came to senior year, I had a chance, you know, it was an NFL talent, once they said, and mid to late round pick, got drafted Mr. Irrelevant, last pick in the 2008 draft. And so, again, I had achieved a dream of, of playing in the NFL, excuse me, of being drafted in the NFL. So you can call me Mr. Anything you want. It didn't matter. Uh, yeah, right. And right. I didn't know this whole irrelevant week and this party in California and all of this stuff with the Playboy Mansion and Disneyland and all these cool things existed. But frankly, uh, you know, I, I was ready to go to work. And so I went in and became a starter rookie year, one of the first to do that. And, and for me, it was uh, I love that underdog mentality. I wanted you to doubt me. I wanted you to think that uh, you could rely on your talent alone. And so. For me, it was the shark in the water that if I stopped swimming, I was going to get eaten. And that was the thing that made me successful. And I think that's the never quit attitude on the, the competitor side, the fight side. But the never quit attitude for me on the back side is really where I found the greatest breakthroughs or at least changed the definition of how I measure success. And that's really, you know, my identity was in football. Like you tell me where someone's identity lies, that's where their power is. That's where their source is. And if you wrestle with that at all, you can fracture the, the character of a man, or at least you can test this character. And in that case, it was football. Um, I blew out my shoulder really bad with the Seahawks. I knew that that season was over and potentially a career. And in that moment, it was just panic because I wasn't supposed to ask for help. I wasn't supposed to uh, do anything except for what I was elite at. And I worked my whole life to become elite at football. Suddenly, boom, it's pulled away, or at least you feel like there's a chink in the armor. And that was a wide open like avenue, I think, for you know, coping to come in. And my fear was I didn't know who I was looking back at myself in the mirror. And I started to just take pain pills. And eventually it was just downward spiral, led to a drug detox, uh, a couple of seizures and detox, lost 34 pounds, just gnarly. I mean, rock bottom to the, to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. And so in that place was, was the beauty of me picking myself up, not no longer on David's will or just the strength of what I thought I was as a football player, but realizing that my gifts were, were really probably profoundly meant for someone else. And it's not that I didn't care about people when I was playing, but uh, as I retired from the league or stepped out of that year, I just realized, man, like I was not using David to the utmost way that I think the, the maker of this universe wanted to. And so now with, mm. with finding this, this passion for training veterans, for training wounded war fighters in the gym, recalibrating their mind and their body. I mean, I'm literally, this is, this, this is Tahoe. It's dumping snow right behind me. It's April. And we got 22 veterans that we trained for nine weeks that are out here on the mountain and the smiles are unconscious. They're not forced. They are freaking constant. And they are unbelievable to see as these guys just nice. sure. blow, yeah. blow it out. So anyway, that's the tightest two minute I could do. Real quick, you know, it was interesting. You know, I was very fortunate to kind of meet you really as you transition out of the NFL. Um, and I watched you kind of go through these iterations of who you are and what you wanted to be. Talk a little bit about really when you discovered, you always had this joy in training people. But talk about the moment where you saw this opportunity to, 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 to work with people who we call recalibrated carnivores now, kind of what that story was and, and how it's evolved into what you're doing right now. Yeah, I think it's mindset that you guys are just, you guys are being, this is in, trained and ingrained in you, but it's this idea that you treat a man broken, he'll act broken. You know, you look somebody in their eyes, you treat them like a whole person. I mean, Clint, we've talked about this. You've told me that numerous times. So for me, it was realizing that it wasn't just training, uh, the ability to see, Hey, if I do this and this, something's going to change to a desired outcome. But it's almost an alchemy. It's this idea of changing matter and changing something, the it, in someone. And that's relative to whatever that it is that they're facing. And in my case, uh, being transitioning out of the league and starting the gym, I, I loved training because I was a transformational piece. But it was different because there was one critical move where I realized I love to train and mentor people using the gym as the conduit. Right? So sweat psychology because pain, as we all know, you guys mm. to a great extent, that pain is the only way to make significant behavioral change. It is. But once you do it, the body's going to create that avenue, that pathway, that synapse to fire in a way that it redirects. And this is why, you know, whether it's 40% rule or why the guys at Red Bull were just shocking endurance uh, cyclists when their brain got to that point where their quit came in, where it said physically shut down. Like, hey, I'm going to pull blood to these areas. I'm going to do this. The body is a great reflection of what, how brilliant the mind can be if we could do this. The governor... Right, that says, hey, too much pain, shut mm -hmm. it down. We can lift that with redirection. So the redirection that's used with Red Bull, mm -hmm. they were shocking these guys. I don't think too significantly, but think about if, if normal people could access that. You know, it's that never quit mentality that people can't put into words, but we know and we know what the it is because we had somebody look in our eyes at some point and say, hey, it is in you. 
right? It's in you. And then when you realize that the it is actually not even meant for you, that's when it becomes like, no, that's when all of a sudden the aperture for life changes and you see with the resonant meaning why your gifts match someone's needs. Oh, wow. You know, you know how you temper steel, right? You get it really, really hot and really, really cold and you beat the mess out of it. I mean, that, what we do when we go into buds training is that exact same thing. I mean, we're just blocks of flesh going in there and they, they redirect us in every single direction, man, and mold us into what they want. They what what they want us to be. They strip away all that all that the wasted stuff, right? And what mm-hmm. you guys know, man, we walk out of buzz. What we are is perfectly trainable weapons or pieces of metal, right? That you can do right. anything, and that's the mentality. Because you're right. What what we find when we go through all this is our mind and our body. Be- come equal if our body finally catches up to those dreams we had our entire lives like man i think i can do this but i don't know and then eventually when you graduate you're standing there and those two things are running on the same level there's literally nothing we can't go try to do if you put it in front of us Mm -hmm. hey even knowing that it's going to kill all of us just say hey man throw that down there see if these boys can do it we will figure out a way to try and get that done we will find everybody finds an excuse to get out of something we will hang on to the very mundane detail to stay in it. And that, that's just the life. So I, I wholeheartedly believe this, that your disadvantage is in fact your advantage. It's just life is a hand of poker. And so maybe there's an example you guys can specifically hit of when you know you knew exactly what the disadvantage is. And the advantage of knowing what the disadvantage is is now you have the advantage, right? So how has there been a position in that? Not mm-hmm. Maybe tactical, maybe not, but maybe just in life. Because I now see that I can intersect my mind and my body not for optimization on the football field or, you know, how to run this blitz, but specifically to how, you know, I can reach somebody on a level and then at the same time is teaching me. And so there's that sort of cyclical action of, of apprenticeship or mentorship or just investing in people. So is there an example you guys have of something like that? I, I'll tell you for me, <clears throat> you know, my, my, my disadvantage has always been my advantage, you know, and all you guys know, good that luck. I was the, the good look, I was the, well, you're my looks, about? they are what they are. I mean, it's, it's always been, you know, I'm more than just a piece of meat. <laughs> I have thoughts and ideas. I write songs. They're hmm. not good, but, hmm. but you know, for me, uh, you know, here <laughs> says I delight in my weakness. I boast in my weakness. For me, being the fifth string fullback in eighth grade, but loving the game enough to, <laughs> you know, what it did is it let me know, like, hey, if you're going to do anything, you need angles, allies, and advantages to do anything worthwhile. So to exhaust my talent in eighth grade and to recognize that, hey, I, I, there's got to be something more than me to do what it is and I say I want to do and start pursuing that thing, that's always kind of been the secret for me. And I think that, you know, Buds reveals that to us and then the game reveals that to us and some of that other stuff. They've talked, Marcus, you, you got, I mean, you got a million for those and then Wizard, you do as well. You, uh, mine's my friends. Yeah. I get into a group of people, man. I suck everything they are into me. And whatever mm. direction we're going, man, it fuels me. And I I am literally pushy mm. with everything I have from the middle. Everything I have. I, it doesn't matter. Whatever environment I walk into, I will immediately suck <laughs> into that. And I, that's why team guys will watch the same movies over and over again. People, my wife just get on to me for that. I'm like, yeah, I do that. <laughs> because if I went out in combat and got my ass handed to me, I came back in and watched a war movie that was similar to that and trained my mind on how I was supposed to react and think. Because in Hollywood, always the good guys are going to win and come out at the end, man. And we never train to lose, ever. I never remember training right. to lose. We would train to get our asses whipped or to get killed, but I never remember training to lose in when we, I just kept following everybody, the strongest men I could find. I mean, anything, and it led me straight to you guys. And once I got in the middle of that, man, I, I was just a faceless part of that. I literally would just work as hard as I possibly could to, to, to adapt, to be good enough to stay there. And, and the energy that all of our guys put out, man, was all I ever needed for gasoline. It didn't matter what we were doing, man. I was all in. I was that guy. I could. I guess that was my ability. That's the, that, that's the I, natural selection thing, right? Like you, you can only find what's truly, uh, it, it, truly opposed to annihilation in you uh, by by just testing it, right? It's just like putting it back out there in the field to see how it does and see how it does. And so, but you know, th- sure. I think at some level, though, uh, done in a way that you're looking to glorify self, right? I think that's the distinction, at least in my life, in my experience, what I, my story. I think the biggest catapult or or platform a rebound was when I realized that, man, it wasn't just because 
uh, David was self-seeking in the effects of football. Like it was a deeper character thing than that. What I needed to flesh out was just more, why was I, why did I feel like I had to have the achieve, like the achievement piece, external validation, right? Uh, that, that affirmation, because you're used mm -hmm. to coach saying X or doing this. And if you're looking to, to coach always for that, then you're doing it for the grade, right? And that's where I think that, that football became the job to me. And now what I get to do, I mean, it's a life in which I look at someone and I realize that the breadth of the words or the things and the time I'm spending with them, it actually sticks. And sticks in a way that can have a profound outcome as long as, you know, I just realize that, dude, it's not because David has some, you know, it, it, amazing ability aside from just the fact that he's willing to talk to people and care. Hmm. Hey, talk about, talk about Travis. You know, it was one of the things, you know, I watched that kind of um, – Fusion happened between you and, and Fission happened between you and Travis when y'all met. And talk about, you said something about 30 seconds ago about how go where your fear is. And we talked to Carly Fiorina yesterday and she was talking about, you know, go where your fear is. And talk about how you began to, how you kind of took Travis to where his fear was and to show him that he could keep doing those things. Because I think it's an amazing story about never quitting. Yeah. Well, my background is psychology. I was a psychology guy in college and the, the human performance stuff that I learned is just cause white, white guy in the NFL, baby, white guy at a skill position. I had to, I had to, uh, I had to do what Marcus just said, man, is evolve and adapt and, and grow and sponge from those people and literally be the pest that says, Hey, you know, you're a 12 year NFL vet and I'm going to be in your hip pocket. Uh, but with Travis, I, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, again, I walked up to quadruple amputee, Travis Mills, at Clint's surprise 30th birthday party. I just challenged him to work out with me. And he's like, you know, hey, man, I don't have arms and legs. You know, that seems like it'll be pretty hard. And it was just saying, man, like, look, I understand that your body looks different, but why can't you tap back into the physicality? And frankly, you know, I was just curious and bold and I think maybe even cocky enough to believe that I could do something special with him or maybe I just listened to what the call was on my heart. So Travis shows up first day and I, and I just, I, to be real with you, I don't know what prompted this question aside from maybe, you know, me just wanting to get a, a little bit more around, around his persona, his personality. And I said, well, what, are you, what are you most afraid of? He said, falling. Right? When I fall, gravity wins. No arms, no legs, right? It hurts. Mm. I said, perfect, that's where we're starting. And in the practical sense, starting with, with balance was perfect because it was about uh, proprioception, right? Understanding the body's uh, ability and movement in space, but also core stability and balance. But what we did is we desensitized the fear, right? Because fear is perception. Right, the body senses right. certain yep. things Absolutely. and takes in certain information mm -hmm. and creates some type of a, a narrative in our mind. And and danger is real. Hell yeah, danger is absolutely real. But the fear piece is always the part that, and I and I think this is the critical piece. It's 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 usually not uh, the fear that most would say. Hey, this guy's probably scared of X, or this guy's not scared of anything. Right? Like the the things that whisper in your quiet moments are the same things that whisper in the person's quiet moments that haven't been through war or going through Absolutely. so 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 the one yes, draw out is this we all hear the whisper of you're not worth it right you, what if they find out you're a fraud that imposter syndrome because it messes with our head so with travis i used falling it desensitized it he all of a sudden became this person that no longer was held back of the fall it became like a good martial artist right or a drunk driver in a car crash that's so lots of times unhurt because they're relaxed right the impact so yeah. there's a lesson in that for sure about why you have to access the root fear to create three standard deviations of profound change in your life. Well, I remember you had him on that little half Swiss ball and you're literally pushing him. And I remember watching him get mad at first until he started realizing what you're doing. And then once he had that awareness, then he started kind of adjusting and flowing around it. Like l literally it was, hey, you still got balance. You still have core strength. And Travis is a big, strong kid, man. And it was, hey. it was fun for you to... Let me ask you guys this. So uh, one of the firemen, excuse me, police officers that we just finished training, uh, he's swinging the sledgehammer one day. And I don't know how much visualization you guys use currently in your daily life or how much they use uh, training you guys in the teams and whatnot. But uh, this cop I, is about five weeks into the program. It's a nine week training course. And as he's swinging it, and he's doing it with full force. He's doing it with aggression. But I said, okay, hey, you got three sets left of 30 seconds. Each one, we're going to imagine something. I'm going to make you think about something. And the first was every time that he'd snap at his wife, since he lost his leg. And with every swing, you watch the emotion of it. And you know, it, was, it was anger. It was anger. And then the second time I said, every time you, you snapped on your kids, it was more, right? It was more. And then I said, every time that you knew you were supposed to take one sleeping pill, but you took 10. At the time that you took six times more than you needed to with this pain medication. And he just kind of looked at me and that switch hit again. 
and a look in his eyes, his tears. And, it, and again, I, I wasn't, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a, you know, I'm not trying to do this to be Robin Williams and Goodwill Hunting. Like, but what I'm trying to get him to realize is the anger itself has to be flushed out by using the good pain to push out the bad pain. And I think like, that's an example of visualization used in a way that ties that mind body to a point where like he remembers what it was like to look down at that nub for the first time and get angry. So I think with Travis, fear and anger was really synonymous because he didn't want to be embarrassed. He didn't want to look dumb. That, that was the other part of the, the mental barriers. Bro, I, I just want to go back to this one deal. I don't know if we can plug this in. You said something, a shark analogy, <laughs> and you may have glazed over that and not remembered you said yeah. it. That was a big deal to me because I had this huge fear in my high school yearbook. says greatest fear, eaten by a shark, which is, <laughs> I don't know why in the hell I became a full-time frog man. <laughs> but on top of that, Right. I have a lot of time in the water. I mean, I am a frog man. I'm, there's, there's seals and frog men. I'm, I'm a sneaky frog man kind of deal. And I got in the water the first time, and I, we're, I'm down for eight hours, ten hours one time. I mean, just... just the beauty and it's of the one of the STV. deals you said, hey, man, never stop swimming. And that, that's right. And when I first got in, I was not only swimming, but I was looking around for the man in the gray suit. The man in the big gray suit. Here's the, de <laughs> here's the deal, man. You, I had to tell myself, I know he's in here. I'm not top of the food chain. He's the boss in here. But I am so well trained. I deserve to be in this, right? So I stopped looking for him. Because if he showed up and he came, I would deal with him when he showed up, which meant nothing. You know, you don't deal with a great white. You just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I had to. I told myself that, and you're right, man. Quit looking for the shark. All right, he is there. The troubles, the problems, the the hiccup, whatever it is, man. The shark will always be there. All you need to do do is plan your dive and dive your plan. That's what saying the teens, man. From the time my head went underwater, I kicked out, never yeah. looking for the trouble or anything else that, that was coming my way. But if it did show up, I was ready. Which means fear is exactly that. It's the perception of the person who holds yeah. it. And fear is a lack of training for the situation that you're in. We still all have the fear, but once we train in that situation, that turns to the anxiety, which is can be easily confused. I'm I'm trained so much, I, I'm anxious to get in here and do this. And but if it is a real fear, that's the fear of you not believing in your in the training that you have, and that's what you have to do. Always believe in yourself. You start denying that. What's the point? Yeah, hmm. it's the obstacle is the way, right? Uh, you know, a lot of people, yeah, very very yeah, few but, people allow pain to be the thing the magnet you know and uh, frankly i in your pain is your power like we talk a lot about scars and you know man obviously there's some really cool scars i get to see every day from these guys that are blown up and burned stuff and i say cool because i think right, it's amazing right? they got badass scars man they, had, they do have badass <laughs> scars yeah i mean like the josie wells and you know what like right. that story of that is is all time and that's profoundly why they are bigger than what tried to hurt them and profoundly why they can defy what once tried to define them but it's not by hiding them, right? Like Clint, you, what is, you always say, uh, you don't trust an unbroken person. Right? Yeah. If, you've been, if you are willing to show your scars, you can prove that you're going to move beyond them. Or at least I'll go to battle with someone that says, hey, I'm not perfect, but I'm working on those things that are, I want to improve. Yeah, I say fear the unscarred man because he's either lying to you or he's never dared, and both are really dangerous in a fight. Yeah, go find his buddies probably. They're covered in scars. Hey, what you're doing, man, you're, you're enabling those warriors to get back uh, – into their mindset, into their life, man. There's there, there's pride in coming back, especially if you're missing something. If you become part of a cyborg, or a, I mean, you're wearing something that this country built to put you back together because you're one of our warriors. Walk around and let everyone know that. I mean, you don't boast it. You just you walk with a confidence and a, and a swagger that you have after going through something like that. Don't bend your head down because you busted up, man. I mean, you got some scars. You flaunt those. That's that's life right there, man. That's experience. All of my tattoos are not victories and didn't say mama tried. My mom uh, did more than try. She got it done, right? Mine are my battles that I've lost. The friends, it tells my story. When I stand with my brother, it tells our life yep. story. Yeah. I mean, that's what that's what all that's about. This is your whole, uh, not down this rabbit hole. It's your temple, man. This is your machine. You're inside of it just God dang, man, I turned into a fucking T-Rex. You got me fired up now, man. I, you, know yeah. you just go, baby. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we got we to gotta send you guys a video, Dave. I mean, you know, so we go from meeting Travis at the party to next day he's working out, and then how many days was it later? We got the video, and we'll send it to you because you can put on T the TQ website of, of, of Travis pulling a 125-pound sled on his, on his prosthetics. It's awesome because, you know, that, that was happening as Travis was just – fighting himself physically uh and he's looking at our nfl guys that are training alongside right and they're like oh my pinky toe my pinky toe hurts so, travis so like, much trash and that's beautiful because 
Because that's it, man. There's a, my gym is, there's a box on the floor taped off. It says sympathy box. If you want sympathy, you can stand in the box. I don't care if that's one of our pro guys or a warrior or civilian. It doesn't matter because like, it's, it, pain, fear, scars are agnostic of race, gender, sexual preference, injury, veteran, civilian. It doesn't matter. So if that's true and those are humanistic characteristics that, that are felt every single day, then why is it that we, 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 sh- we hide them? We shun people. Uh, we, we try to avoid our pain. We try to run from our pain and soften our pain, right? Like what I do when I work out still today, and I know Clint's this way, you know, we, we get to a point in our workout where we could easily say, hey, this is good. This is a workout that's better than most, and we could check the box. Or we could do what we do, and then we try to do something that literally kicks us in the nuts so hard that we have to feel pain. At least this is me. I have to feel alive. I either have to make myself throw up uh, make myself hurt so bad that I like go to failure to a point that I know it's not healthy for me. In fact, if I was coaching me, I wouldn't tell me to do what I'm doing at the phase of my life, but I need it because that physical pain reminds me that I'm alive in a way that's so much different than what I can ever do in business or speaking from a stage or, and even different than what it is while I'm coaching hands on that's fulfilling. But the physical part of me, I text Clint this the other day, maybe a couple months ago, I was like, Hey man, do you ever just walk in the grocery store and you just have this urge to just deck somebody? Like just full out, just dr- drop the guy on aisle six and just pass. And I, I'm like, sure. and he's like, dude, yeah, it's Absolutely. like three times a week. I'm like, Clint doesn't normally go to a grocery store, but if he did, that's how it would be. I get confused and scared. But like, you know, but I just need to know that I'm not weird, you know? Cause I'm like, that's the, that's the guy in me that's not, he's, he's not going to die. Let me, let me tell you something. Last, last summer, man, I, I, I came out of Exos. I came out of the program. We had, I had all my buddies here and my doctor on the phone. Melly went out of the country on a mission trip. I went down to our pond, had a hundred tons of river rock dumped down. And for eight days straight, I pushed that river rock through that pond with a rake until my feet were bleeding through my shoes. <laughs> Took pictures of it. I had seven hours of sleep in eight days. I literally pushed myself to see how far I could go. I mean, I try and make my hands bleed every day. Where's you? I mean, this I'm out and working. I, I got all of this so I could work it, not have somebody else do that. And that I will always test myself physically because if all this is jerked away from me, I know where I can start and I know how hard I can push. And th- that is important to me. To And what that tells you is this isn't some kind of something I did, right? This isn't something you did. This is our, this is our life. This is how I am made. I, I do this because this is how I exist. Everything around me is not white noise. It's, it's what I am. Hey, you, I mean, you can label us Navy SEALs, football players, or whatever you want to call us, man, but we're a certain type of man, and we yeah. do a certain type of thing, and if we, we have to do that because it feeds it. I say, this to my, I say this to my wife all the time. Actually, I say this to my dad. Actually, I got really pissed off at my dad when I first said this. So, Clint, you'll remember, uh, been at your, I was at your place for about a year. And, and again, remember, like, when I found Clint and his guy, his, the tactical side of his company, and we put – the gym and what I was shooting with these injured veterans and in, inside of there, it was just like a locker room. Cause like, yeah, I miss, I, hell yeah. I miss Sundays. They're amazing playing football, but I miss the locker room more than anything. And now all of a sudden that tribe was back. I had a group of group of people I could connect with. But, uh, as we were in your gym and, and we started to just do what we were doing in training, I realized, man, that I didn't have uh, a way for myself to be measured mentally, physically, spiritually, and just like that scared me straight up. And I got a call from this casting director of its National Geographic, but I did six days, middle of the ocean, uh, middle of the Bermuda Triangle, no food, no water, six days on a little float, uh, soft bottom uh, life raft. The partner that you meet for the first time. And the whole point is just... See, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> crazy, man. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> we call it, yeah. we call it, that's a, that's a <laughs> everyone tries to avoid is what you decide to avoid. Well, the producer calls me, he starts describing it. He says, how are you in the water? Told my shower daily. He, he thought that was pretty good. Very good. And I said, look, I said, I got a bunch of buddies literally right here with me that are Navy SEALs. He's like, ah, no, no, no. We got SEALs, but we want you to do this. I said, okay, well, let, let, me just, let me talk to my wife. My wife's pregnant with our second child at the time. <laughs> I go home. I said, sweetie, how much do they have to pay me? She's like a million dollars. I said, this is reality TV. They're going to pay me like the ten and fifty. So I go out and basically he knew something. What he knew, the producer, was he planted a seed. And guys like me, like I, the next day he called me, he's like, have you, have you thought about it? And what he did was he planted a seed because I, I didn't have football anymore. And I couldn't preach to the guys I was training in the gym to be comfortable being uncomfortable, like to actually like become addicted to that feeling. Uh, and, and I decided to say, yes, I got paid nothing. And I went out there and I did this miserable trip. But what I, what I realized as I did it, my dad pissed me off. He said something to me as I was leaving. He said, Hey man, I know that you're hanging out with a lot of these war guys. Now these guys that served, 
Now, granted, we come from mm-hmm. three generations. Of, I know exactly what you're about to say. Three God, generations God, of Marines boy. in my mm-hmm. family. My grandfather fought in three wars, 31 years, Lieutenant Colonel of the Marine Corps. And he says to me, I just hope this isn't your, you know, your deployment. This isn't you trying to like prove that you're going to war. And I like, at first I wanted to fire back. I didn't because it's my dad and I never do that to respect too much respect. But I said to him, Hey, like I can try to be smart, but I can't be safe. Like, it's just, just, it's not like that is, and that's probably the best way to describe me. And my wife knows who she married. And that's why I ended up going on that trip because she knows who she married. And that's it. I, she knows that I have to be able to put myself in those opportunities to see if I can grow. Yeah. And that's why we train too, as well. And it's only a di- dangerous situation for other people, right? I mean, we, when we're looking at it, that's what we, I got to get myself into that. You know what I'm talking about? And all the training we do is to prepare me for it. And yeah, there's a probably pretty good chance I'm gonna get my ass kicked or die. Yeah. Make sure you talk about me when I'm yeah. gone, right? Yeah. Hell yeah. Absolutely. Hell yeah. yeah. Dave, one of the things I, I, I think the listeners, and, and here's what I love about the show is really anybody listening to this, what you just heard before say, what you just heard Marcus say is at the end of the day, it's critical that once a day you beat yesterday's you somehow. Like you got to find a way to beat yesterday's you somehow. And if it's hold your breath one second longer, do one more rep, do one more, make yourself. But if you beat yesterday's you, that's like, you know, Admiral McCraven says, you know, make your bed and you know, you did something that day, <clears throat> man, I, I, I just, I don't know how to make my rack, but, but what I do, if I can beat yesterday's yeah, listen, somehow, man, then I that won thing. that day. And that's really what these two guys are saying is beat yesterday's you every day. Dave, one of the things we talked about a little bit before you got on the show, Wizard and I were talking about this is, you know, there's two kind of ranking structures when you're when you're in a group. It's like based on their skill, like, hey, they're really good at so-and-so and so-and-so. And then there's a separate, equally respected ranking structure of just how much pain someone can take. And for me, as a guy who's not incredibly gifted, I've always said, oh, i got to hang my hat on that ability to absorb punishment. When you were in the league, who impressed you? And it doesn't have to be one guy. Who impressed you most with just the amount of punishment they could take the, the 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 amount of suffering they were willing to do for the game for their teammates and uh for what they were trying to do yeah danny and medola i was with him a couple of days ago he's he's a tough mug dude he's I know a houston him. kid yeah lubbock boy yeah he yeah. played down at tech and obviously i mean look put it this way we were <laughs> laughing and danny and i because we were we were at the rams together when he uh see cowboys had him practice squad he ended up in philly we traded for him First day of practice, Richie Incognito, who's, you know, just this massive monster of a man, lineman now for uh, the Bills. Richie, Danny comes into the huddle, little guy, and Richie says, oh, I didn't know this was bring your little brother to work day. And I'll never forget it because, <laughs> like, Danny just took it in stride. He got smoked that first day of training camp. And then every single day after, yeah, I just watch him get up. I just, I mean, he's, he, I watched him separate his SC joint uh, inward. So they had to put him to sleep because they then they reset it. It can hit his aorta and bleed out. Bleed out. And they wouldn't let him. He, he wouldn't let him put him to sleep because he wanted to go back out and finish the game. Uh, and they if they put him to sleep, he wouldn't. They said, "Okay, so you understand the risk." And he said, "Let me sign the paper. Let me sign the paper." And I just I sat there thinking to myself, like right now, and this is the the, the disillusionment. This is the crazy rationale that guys like us function under, uh, which is. I, I get it, and I love it. This, you know, this gets me wanting to kick down a door. But Danny looked at him and said, "You're going to reset this right now. Sign the paper." They did it. He went in and finished the game. Yeah. Sure. I mean, that's th- those are the things that just happened. Mm-hmm. So Danny Amendola, not only because he's small and he takes the beating, but that's one of the toughest mugs I've ever played with. Well, I mean, you get that from the guys who are thankful to be doing what they're doing. I mean, those yeah. are the guys who put the work in. And back to your question, I think that balance of the amount of misery you'll, you're willing to take, uh, you know, like NBA players always get a bad bag because the way they train or don't train. Like NBA players are uh, typically a generalization would be that they just don't, they don't like to dig into that pain factor we're describing. Well, then you got hockey guys on the total other end of the spectrum that like if, if something's not, you know, ridiculously terrible and horrifically uh, painful to go through, they're like, dude, I didn't work out today. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think that it's not just if that's like the talent's kind of measurement. I think it's, it's the, to me, it's about figuring out why you're intentional about how you're leveraging pain uh, in, in every area of your life. And I think that for David Vibora, the talent piece, my, my head was always really important for me to be able to play all three positions. Uh, but it was also the part to me that if I was thinking too much, I couldn't use my maximum. Effect. So it's just, it's the beautiful paradox of that. And I wrestle t- currently with the same mindset of, how am I the relentless driven, the shark in the water guy? But I can also realize that 
uh, I don't have to white knuckle and bleed and sweat for everything like I did as, as, as a linebacker in the league and still deserve it. The, Becoming addicted to pain almost. One of the, the fortunate things we have are, are all the guys who came before us are still around. We hang out with each other. And, and they've the path that they cut for all of us coming up underneath them, it's one of those deals where, yeah, you, you should demand that I act like that. You demand that I fight like that. Mm-hmm. I have identified myself as one of the people that when this, whenever, whatever it is we do goes down, you send us. So there, there's no second guessing. If you have worked your butt off to get to a certain place and, and you're there, then that's, man, that's kind of all the, what's that? There's a word. I don't know. That's all you need, right? That's, that's it. And once you get in there, think about that and say, all right, I worked my ass off to get into a spot to where everybody knows what I am and they should and they expect me to be a certain way. And that was, that's fuel in itself, man. You walk, we walk around like that. I mean, our people is what we signed up right. for, to, to represent our people. You don't think we kick a door in that American flag or that Texas flag on my chest. The first thing through the damn door that the whole United States is standing behind me. That's how much power we think we have when we're out there. We're the 14 guys that are set up and fixed to blow through that door, our weight is measured by every individual walking in this country, man. And that is some freaking power. Once you get mm. that in your head, man, there, there's, you, the only way you can beat us, and it's, this is one of those when people identify me coming off that mountain by myself. I, I came off the mountain by myself, but I'm not alone. All right. I fell right back mm. into my family, right into my brothers. They put me right back where I needed to go, and they demanded that I did that. The older guys who came before us demand that we fight like we do, that we widen that road. And I demand that the SEALs coming underneath me better do the damn same thing. I, I, you, know, you know what I'm talking about? And, and yep. I think that's yep. important for, for, for us as a community to, to expect what, I mean, yeah, you, you're a Mr. Irrelevant, right? You got, look, and, and Buzz, I was the slowest runner probably in SEAL history, maybe besides Clint, Clint's, right? He's faster than I am. I mean, I was Mr. Goon Squad, Mr. Beatdown, Mr. Wet and Sandy. You, you, you name it, man. I own those, right? And I, you, it's one of those that, yeah, I, I might have been the last dude coming through here, but guess what? I was, I was checking rear security. There's nobody behind me. Let's go. Come on. That kind of we're thing. Good. Yeah, we're, we're good. good. Let's go. we're, I got it back here, brother. I was trying to run rear security. Yeah, I like I got that. It. That's a good excuse. <laughs> what, uh, Marcus, I got a question. For you, Like, where, where do you find yourself battling between – uh, you know, where people put seals and, and the sort of the image, this, this very much superheroistic kind of uh, persona over what you guys do. And how, how do you deal with words like hero? How do you deal with words like, you know, all that stuff? Because you guys both do it your own way very brilliantly and in a way that I think points to the fruits of your labor, the fruits of what you believe in and not yourself as, as the kingdom. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm blessed in, in the fact that I still very – much a part of my community. The, all this story, the Lone Survivor, the books, that was the military. Right. Make no mistake, SEALs are not just door kickers. And, and I mean, we, we, we do a lot of things. My new job was to focus the attention on making sure the story came out and stayed the way it was supposed to stay. It, the, the, the Lone Survivor, the book, is a debrief. Right? And I, all I was supposed to do is to go out and represent our community the best way. You don't think for one second every time I wake up, I know I represent 19 guys. 19 guys. I carry my I never bowed my head. I never bent my damn knee ever. Because I, I represent all those guys. When they, I, that hero, I, that cripples me. I hate it. Sick to my stomach. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those deals where they throw that at me. It goes right past me into the guys that, did, that didn't make it, man. And I, 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 loved the community i loved being a navy seal and this is why i always re- go back to them because in our community i'm i'm not a hero i'm just a regular i actually i'm in the lost column <laughs> i i was still got his ass you know i'm part of the ass whipping we got one time which is okay because i didn't quit i came back and, and they you know i ran right into my guys they let me have it they got me back online i went back into iraq you know exactly where i was supposed to be and and that's the best part about it. the only you got to understand because of social media and everything the Marcus a trail out outside of the SEAL teams. That's y'all do that. That's different. I don't look at myself any like that. I I, I don't seriously. I mean, what, I don't even know what that means. What you know, I don't feel any different. I feel like I I always did. I just pull my weight. I'm holding a spot for the kid coming up underneath me. That's it. I got to make sure I do it 
with some honor and integrity. And I, I'm a damn, I'm a man, you know, and I fight hard. That's it. That's all I ever gave. That's it, man. There's nothing special. And, that, and that's all everybody, uh, every listener in the room can give that. And that's kind of what the whole point of the, of the show is to encourage you to become some heroic version of yourself because that shows that you're worth the time that other people poured into you. Like for me, it's always been, hey, be worth the time, man. The time that someone poured into you, be worth that time with the time that you have. Hey, listen, this is one of those shows that we can literally go for hours and hours and hours. But if we do that, we're keeping people from listening, from shutting this off and getting to work, becoming a heroic version of themselves and making themselves matter um, in the community that they're in right now. So, so man, before I just want to tell you, it's been so fun to be your friend and to watch what you've done and watch what you continue to do. But if you could do one thing, and I think you did it earlier, and maybe just say those three again, but we always love in and with three things people can put to work right at the hangout. So if you get three points of performance, three pieces of advice to the listeners right now that you think that they can make a difference today, would you do that for us real quick? Yeah, I think the three biggest things is, the first is <laughs> advance toward fear. Fear is the number one piece that, that confines people and it perpetuates the cycles of destruction or lack of potential development in your life i see fear so advance toward fear second is to advance toward toward freedom and that's by taking action uh so the, the 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 fear piece man whatever the narrative that's written in your head realize that that that, that mountain is only a molehill and in fact even if the worst case of what you put out in your head seems like your world will end go through it and you're going to be transformed so advance toward fear toward freedom and the last toward fulfillment so uh, those are your F's, fear, freedom, and fulfillment. And the level of fulfillment only happens when you do advance toward fear and toward freedom. Because you can't do number three without first doing one and two. And they're both progressively harder, uh, but, but progressively uh, more powerful and, and more productive. So advancing toward fear, man, overcome it, freedom, and then all of a sudden a new, new lens for fulfillment. And fulfillment is, is widening your vision to see where it is that you can serve someone. Because before your fear defined you, and so you let embarrassment, the potential of what others will think, really stop you in your tracks, paralyze you from moving. But now all of a sudden, like a sixth sense, you'll, will, you'll recognize areas that you can just shop. Maybe it's freaking smiling at someone. Maybe it's buying them someone something. Maybe it's using your part of the story as the defining factor in fulfillment. Maybe you were abused as a kid, and you're going to go now repurpose that to kids that are, that are struggling with abuse. Whatever it is. Uh, make those th those three be the F's: fear, uh, freedom, and fulfillment. I hate to be the slow kid in the class, but can you expound a little bit on the freedom part? I don't quite understand how that. Uh, yeah, so I, I say the advance that. toward. Yeah, so the advance toward fear is is identifying what your fears are, and I think people are really good at taking inventory. Sure. But I'd say I'd say go a little deeper. I'm not talking about the fear of public speaking. Think of it in the lens of of you know what are you avoiding. Where are you surface right. living? Like, where are you allowing uh, secrets to live? Because you knew if someone knew that you, it would scare you, right? So that's the first is like just this like understanding of what it is that's sort of defining you. That if you could, perfect world, you were going to die tomorrow, you were going to jump, what would it be? Mm -hmm. Then there's the, the freedom piece is the action necessary to jump. Uh, it's the leaning into it and then actually uh, 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 making the step to overcome it. Because I think, you know, failing is the, the next success, of course, right? Mm -hmm. You're always moving toward that goal, but failure is just quitting, right? So if we know that quitting is failure, well, we're gonna remove any quit and we're gonna say that that one specific thing, I'm gonna make a decision to act on what it is that scares me. Like I have a person who will mm -hmm. tell me to go, a mentor of mine goes lay down in the Starbucks, right? It's a Tim Ferriss move. So you lay down in Starbucks for 30 seconds, but at first, everyone's staring at you and you look like an idiot. I love Still that. Still look like an idiot. And at the end, you get up and you're like- I get it. Everybody, I, I could do anything, right? So it's the empowerment piece. Yep. And then as you come out the other side of step two of the freedom, you're like, dude, I have a level of fulfillment because one, I'm a badass. And I just, I just faced something that I, I had been letting fester mm -hmm. in my life and, and, and keep me from living out my greatest potential. And now as, as greatest self, who has overcome those things, taken initiative and acted on them. Now I'm on the, on the third step to realize with the x-ray vision, almost a sixth sense that it isn't just because I was supposed to do this for myself. There's a bigger part of the story, and that's meant to be repurposed, redefined, and how you use it for someone else to lighten their load. Uh, two, two books have had a profound impact on me. One is uh, You Are the Placebo. The second is uh, 
uh, the rise of Superman. Both are dealing with basically uh, peak performance, uh, optimization, my body, spirit. But in, in, in Rise of Superman, have either of you guys read that? Uh, yeah, three times. Okay. Yeah, so the idea is flow state, right? But I I've listened to it. I've listened to it three times. <laughs> okay. I haven't read it. Yeah. I listened to it. <laughs> but the, the, the premise is like, how in 100 years is diving only incrementally improved? And then you get one guy who's crazy enough to try something, it changes everything. And then after that, it's broken you know, yearly by huge strengths or huge lengths. Or the idea of, 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 of Travis Pastrana or uh, some type of an extreme sport athlete who's literally defying physics and death to, to replicate. What is, what is it if someone could just get into that state? Right. And so I think about I, the way I uh, it's synonymous with me is, is the play clock. So I knew that every 35 seconds there was a play clock that would happen. Right. And I knew no matter what fatigue and conditioning or what pain in a physical injury I had, that I had uh, the ability to turn off that completely, literally not feel it for 35 seconds, like th for that amount of time. Right. On, off, on, off. And so what I started to do is use that to teach myself, man, if I can turn it off for the six seconds of a play, and I can feel it during the 35, turn it off for the six. Why can't I extend that? Because what's to say I can't do it a little bit further? And I think that's the part of, of looking how, you know, you take what it is and the teams that are teaching you or what it is and then bottle it up and then give it to those that are younger than you that may be mentoring you in hopes of them surpassing you. Because if not, why the hell are you wasting your time right. pouring into that's somebody? The like I, what Clint pours into me, I know he's going to do it so that he can see me be more successful than him. Because if not, he wouldn't do it. And that's the piece of like, I'm not going to spend my time unless I'm able to see profound change because I found someone that has significant that I believe that they're worth pouring into. So, so to throw another book in there to look at natural born heroes, and, and this goes back to the earlier statement. So the reality is, is World War II was won for a bunch of different reasons. But one of the reasons it was won was because of how on a Crete, because Germany couldn't take Crete when it was supposed to, because Crete is where the art of heroism is born. The entire fitness ecosystem of Crete is based on what they call useful fitness. Your fitness should be that which allows you to take care of someone else. So it's that plus one mentality. What can you, I don't care how much you weigh. I care how much you can carry. I don't care how fast you can run. I care how far you can carry the message. How, how is your fitness useful to the people around you? And, and, and that's, I think, what we've all experienced being a part of team sports and being part of kind of this tribal ecosystem that we've been in our whole lives and we seek to replicate once we get out, which is why we're on the daggone phone today, to, 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 to reenter that tribal zone where the, the truth is always the truth, right? And that's what I love hey, about football. Clint, Clint, but think about this, though, because most people, they don't, they, don't, they don't, the world isn't that way. The world isn't what you just described, like they don't think about, right? So, so I guess my piece is this, we know that, that uh, people are going to use uh, this podcast, for example, right? They're listening right now. What would you give them so that you know, they can, uh, you know, glean whatever it is out of this podcast. It's not just head knowledge, but uh, something specific to that point. I always tell people this, so people, oh, I, would, I need to lose all this. If it's an aesthetic goal, Right, aesthetic. I just want to look oh, better. It's not a last, right? Right, yeah. Because you got to make it. It's either got to be about again something on the line that you could publicly fail, right? Some type of you know uh, potential embarrassment, or it has to be this opportunity for you to to have you know what it is that you're actively pushing yourself toward and make it fun, make it playful, make it matter in a life and death scenario. Because then all of a sudden there's 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 outcome. Right. Absolutely. Yep. We not talk about this, but you mean my entire fitness system right now is based on this. Every six weeks, I move 400 pounds, 100 meters as fast as I can. Because if you add my my family's entire weight up, it's 400 pounds and 100 meters is minimum safe distance. So if my house catches on fire, I know I can move my family 100 yards away, and it's going to get harder every year because my kids are going to get bigger, and I got to move that 100 meters. But you got to put that crucible in front of you. Otherwise, nothing else matters. You're not going to do it for yourself. You don't You don't matter enough to yourself. Look at the way you treat yourself. So you got to put that far metric out there. Go, hey, I'm going to be useful to those around me. I'm going to be able to carry Marcus, Wizard, and you as far as I need to because that's how I matter, right? And so anybody, it's just a decision. You got to decide, hey, do you want to be useful or not? And, and, and you, that's how you make it through hell week. You make it through hell week by taking your mind off yourself. There's always someone more miserable than oh, you. Yeah. You yeah, find yeah. them and you laugh at them because it's funny. And in five minutes, they're going to be laughing at you because you're going to be more miserable mm. than them. Like, I love surf torture because I'm built for that. I'm like, oh, put us in the drink. They stay <laughs> ice baths during football. That's fine. Like, I used to make instructors mad. Like, screw you, instructor. Oh, yeah, y'all hit the surf zone. I'm like, sweet, here we go. Running, you know, Clint's not a gazelle, so it's not my favorite part, right? But 
you want to be useful to those around you. Wait, so good Lord, man. Did you, know, you, were you, were you the class leader? Did you get your class surf tortured on purpose? Just so you didn't have to do anything? Mm -hmm. I wasn't doing nothing. I, <laughs> I think he just he gave right himself that away. <laughs> that was my job. Yeah. I'm up in the water. <laughs> Listen, B, I want you to get back to the mountain. You got a bunch of these recalibrated carnivores on the hillside waiting for you. This has been an awesome interview. Thank you so much for taking the time. Proud of you. Proud of what you're Absolutely. doing. Proud of what all your recalibrated carnivores are doing. And it's fun to be a part of it. Um, so fun to have you know Marcus and Wizard, and you know Morgan is you know twin brother. And this has just been a real special interview. So I'm really grateful. Uh, believe me. You guys have all had an impact on uh, on my story. I know you'll continue to, and I hope to uh, continue to to use the privilege and the pressure of what I'm building for the purpose uh, to cast really hope in this world, and it's with the purpose of doing it uh, in the same rights as you guys. So thank you for being great and making me better. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, even beyond the knowledge, your energy and uh, passion is inspiring. So yeah, thank best you for the being guys, on. man. Tell them keep the head up. Thanks, y'all. Have a good one. Yeah, One of the Take skis care. down. And just go. You didn't even <laughs> say Thorgis. You, you didn't even say Thorgis on air, bro. I, I I thought for sure that was coming out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, boys. Appreciate you. Later. Yep, we're Take out. Mark is out. That's seven different shows in one right there. I don't even know where to start, brother. No, you. I learned a lot. You're right. It was, it was a great show, man. Thank you so much, Dave, for coming on here and, and teaching us all that. Yeah, that was so dense and filled with uh, filled with information. It touched on so many different guests we've had before. Um, he, he did run through a lot of guests, didn't he, on that one? I, really, there's so many parallels. I, I don't even know where to begin. One thing that really stuck out to me, and this is almost a small thing, but fundamentally when he's talking about working in fear, stretching yourself, and making progress when you're in that state, the thing I really liked was the very practical, it almost is, sounds silly, when he was talking about laying down in Starbucks, right? Yeah. I, didn't I think everybody can identify with, with things yeah. like that. How many times have you been doing something where you have stopped yourself for no other reason than a fear of what people might think of you? And that little exercise goes to show you, and that's a very practical thing, you can, it, it, it can take on a thousand different forms. It shows you that you can do that every day and you don't have to develop some elaborate activity to defeat that. You don't have to go run 100 miles. You don't have to, I don't know, go Good. out and, and clean the streets of, of crime. You don't have to, all you have to do is challenge yourself in those small ways, and you're going to be making progress. I thought that was fantastic. Oh, I think people's perception, they, they stretch. I mean, we stretch what people's perceptions of us in that, in that manner with fear, right? It's, right. It wasn't really as bad as I thought it was going to be. Matter of fact, it wasn't anything at all. Yeah, they it's a to tell you that, man. fantastic <laughs> drill that anybody in the next five minutes can do that. One of the things I wrote down when we were talking is this whole concept of beat yourself daily, right? And it's kind of something I've never really articulated well. But but for me, when I say beat yourself daily, I don't mean grab a cat of nine tails or a belt and like crack yourself across the femur. That's what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is find one way to exceed your yesterday's performance, right? When I say beat yesterday's you, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, test. One of the things I wrote down was do one less of what you shouldn't and one more of what you should every day. I don't care how busy your day is. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't. You can't tell me there's not enough time to find a way to do one less of what you shouldn't and one more of what you should. Mm -hmm. If it's one less of those pills that you shouldn't be taking in the first place, great. If it's one more of those reps that you don't like doing in the first place, good. Marcus, that's, you started doing that when you were a little kid and heading towards this ridgeline called being a frogman. And I'm a big fan of everybody who's listening, giving them something they could do. And, and, and what I would challenge you, you strip it all away, do one one less of what you shouldn't and one more of what you should, and you beat yesterday's you, and that's a good day. Go to sleep, wake up, and get after it again tomorrow. Daily, periodic, consistent improvement will move you miles. Yeah, I love that, Glenn. Nice. That was that was good. Both of you, I'm impressed. I don't have anything. I was, <laughs> I was gonna like, say, you know, to climb, to climb, just say to climb a mountain. Stupid? <laughs> yeah. To climb a mountain, you got to start at the bottom. I I read that when I was a boy. It was climb a mountain, go. you got to start at the bottom. You don't know what that means. You don't know what any of this stuff means that guys our age rattle out, right? But we rattle enough of it out, one of them's gonna stick. Yeah, it'll stick, and it'll stick with different people. <laughs> Everybody hears some things differently and it's exactly whole, some, sometimes I mean, that, it stays and that's sometimes the great part it about it man hey uh one thing we want to do is 
Before we sign off of here, here's a story that really jumped off uh, jumped off the page to us. And I love this part of the show. Oh, you got, you got one? one of my favorite parts you of the show. You got one. It really connects with everybody that's listening out there. So, And this comes from Murray. He says, first off, I have to say you guys are doing such a great job with what you're, with what you're up to. It's because of your stories and the stories not only from your guests, but listeners as well, that saved me from going down a dark path. Compared to you guys and the submissions you get of other people's never quit stories, mine is child play, but here it goes. Long story short, my wife and I had been married for only a year and a half when the price of oil fell and I lost my job. We were struggling to pay the bills and just barely scraping by. Things weren't going well at all. I fell into a bad place within myself, and my wife and I actually had to split up because of my attitude. I had felt like I had a dark cloud over my head, and no matter what I did, I just couldn't get myself out of that rut. One day, while I was thinking that I was just going to give up and walk away from everything that I had worked so hard to achieve, I came across the Team Never Quit podcast. After listening to you guys and the stories told by the heroes that you have on your show, it opened my eyes. I decided to pull up my socks and dig in. I realized that things aren't as bad as they seem to be. I'm not getting shot at. I don't have to walk miles for a glass of safe water to drink. I have a roof over my head, meat in the freezer, and a woman who deeply cared for me. Life's too short to live it by yourself. Share with the ones who you care about and the ones who are always there with you when you need them. Listening to the Team Never Quit podcast got me out of the hole that I was in. It changed my whole perspective on life. My wife and I are still happily married, and because of you guys, I can yes. say that. Thank yes. you. Please keep on doing what you're doing. You're changing lives one show at a time. Man, listen, when you can, when you can say, hey, I helped contribute to the rescue of a marriage, like when you can say mm. that, that that was part of what happened that day, like, you know, marriage is under attack. And when you can see family stay together, I don't think there's a person listening or any of us that haven't been stung by, felt the sting of a failed marriage and all these other things. And when you can see marriages stay intact because of something that happened on this show, if you had to shut it all down tomorrow, because you don't know how many kids they have, you don't know what legacy is going to be created out of that preserved union. That's amazing. Amen. Amen. And you know that what I think was so great about that story was it's not something unbelievable. It's not, yeah. it, it's not the, the world's most unique story, but it's a very real story. Uh, I think it's something that, like you said, Clint, so many people can identify with that. I don't know. You know, it's uh, kind of just put some justification in us coming up here and keep uh, doing this. Yeah. Well, I, and and we really, I want to really thank the incredible guests we've had on that have come on and yeah, shared exactly. their stories. Right. I mean, that's it's not us. Saying, I was All like, we're man, doing we didn't do is any, just, that's not us, man. We're just <laughs> filling airspace between when they're talking. The gap, right? Connecting the 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 guest with the listener. Yeah. Right. And I think that's what people don't realize when, like, when they say something. It's like, I feel like we're the lucky ones. Like, we're the lucky ones. We're the one getting away with it every day because we get to have this absolutely opportunity to visit with people, and, and we get to uh, have these opportunities to hear from the listeners. I mean, we're the lucky ones in this whole deal. Look, when y'all write in and we read these, and you tell us it was a specific person that changed, we do our level best to get that to them. I mean, mm -hmm. that that this reciprocate reciprocates right, and it works both ways. I would imagine that. If they heard from from one of our listeners directly from, or from us that hey you directly affected this person this is how you did it that would bring I mean it works both ways help them out and I imagine that it's going to bring some joy to one, to our listener and maybe yep. a day that they have because everybody we have on the show man they're amazing but you can bet they're still in it right they're still pushing hard oh, yeah. still, right mm -hmm. absolutely I love I love that you can do that well hey guys uh, it's been an incredible show why don't uh, Marcus and then we'll give Clint the guest who we so very much appreciate coming on to help us out and give him the final word so well let's start with that clint thanks for for stepping in and doing this man it's always a pleasure you do a fantastic job just <laughs> integrating in here yeah and getting in with the guests and and uh and our listeners so thank you for that thanks to everybody for coming back and listening and and keeping this going and to the amazing guests that we have on thank you for that good lord upstairs and the wife for loving me I'm still some thankful in there. I'll say right now, thankful for the relationship I have with the Brotherhood, with our friends, Marcus Morgan, Wizard, the women in our lives, Mel, Leslie, you know, my bride. Um, 
fun to be honest with you guys. I appreciate the opportunity. When we hang up, I'm going to go move 400 pounds, 100 meters, to make sure I'm useful to my family today. So I appreciate nice. y'all, and I'm out. All right, brother. Talk to you later. I'm out. Never quit. Team never quit. Team never quit.